Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to the i3 podcast. I'm here today with Alistair Barker, who is Head of Total Portfolio Management Investments for Australian Super. Alistair, welcome to the show. Good to be here. So you've been uh, with Australian Super for quite a while. Can you tell me a little bit uh, how you got started in in the investment space? So um, a family friend of mine worked at uh, NAB, as it turned out, and um, in the late 90s, I'd contacted him and he agreed to flick my CV around to do um, what what might be considered illegal now was uh, un- unpaid internships. <laughs> unpaid. Yeah, yeah. So um, I remember someone said to me once, you uh, learn before you earn. And this was a particularly good example. So I managed to pick up a bit of internship work with the chief economist at NAB and then also doing some work with the asset management arm of, of NAB. Uh, NAM, National Asset Management. And there was a small team there doing some work in private markets, um, you know, mainly infrastructure. And, um, you know, they, they decided they were looking for an analyst and they, having done a bit of work with them, they said, oh, why don't you stay on? And um, at the time I was still doing university and I negotiated with the university to do my honours year or defer my honours year to start work. Which, which turned out to be a pretty good call, apart from one minor issue, which is that NAB had just bought MLC right, and were then winding up a heap of their active funds management business. So at the tender age of 20 or 21, I was sort of almost down on the street, so to speak, and had my first, re- had my first redundancy. So, <laughs> so f- when you finally started to get paid, you uh, very quickly <laughs> made redundant. Uh, yeah, well, I, I was redundant for the best part of about three hours. Uh, but thankfully, by that time, I knew it was coming and had agreed terms to go and work at Hastings Funds Management. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty prominent manager in the infrastructure, private equity credit space. Yep. And this was in the early 2000s. And so I'd spent a bit under a decade at Hastings um, working with a number of you know, really talented investors and you know, I, I guess a great bunch of people and a really sort of boutique family oriented culture led by Mike Fitzpatrick in particular, you know, but also people like Tim Poole. What were some of the early learnings there? Um, so I think some of the early learnings were really there's there's really no substitute for hard work and to, to make up your own mind about things, you know, where you know, if you're in a meeting full of people who are going to ask the hard questions about you know, potential transactions that we're looking at at the time, it's important to have a, a really strong conviction about why you like a potential asset or, you know, what's going on with the numbers or the due diligence. And there's really no substitute for actually doing the work and, and making up your own mind. I think the other aspect is, p- particularly in the infrastructure sector, you live with your successes and your failures for a very long time. So it teaches you to think very deeply and make very few high quality decisions. Yep. And, you know, in I think in funds management, that's that's a pretty important discipline that, you know, it, it's not necessarily a game of, of the quantity of decision making, but of, but of quality. And I think you only, you probably only pick up some of those lessons by seeing really good investors and really good people in action. Do you remember some of those decisions that you think in hindsight, okay, this 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 definitely made a difference in in the way that I invested. Well, I mean, a good a good example for me was a particular transaction that myself uh, and, as it turns out, Raf Arndt, who's now the, the CEO of the Future Fund, were involved in, and um, it involved um, a series of gas pipeline assets. And 
if you did a traditional discounted cash flow analysis, the value of the assets was effectively what the kind of book value or market value was. But these assets were based in Queensland and South Australia and New South Wales. And what, what became clear to us was that at some point in time in the future, the flow of gas was going to change. And this was the early to mid 2000s. And we thought, gee, this coal seam gas thing might come off or you know, there could be a sort of other gas supply somewhere in Northern Australia. And so just simply valuing it on a discounted cash flow based on the current known gas reserves got you to a certain point, but actually saying, well, there's probably some embedded value that you're not paying for out in the future. And at the time, coal seam gas wasn't really a, a sort of well understood quantity, certainly not, not the way it is or has been over the last decade. And, you know, so a lot of a lot of the lessons in that were to if you can if you can find investments that you're absolutely bulletproof on your underwriting for the for the a base level of returns. But if you're paying if you're not paying for things that you know may provide future upside, then you know those are usually the best deals. So you know in that particular case, you know it was a it was a good investment on on the base case, but you know that that underwriting didn't price you know a lot of potential future upside. Yeah. yeah. And so now you've been uh, with Australian Super for more than 13 years. Um, mm. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of your first role when you started and also how has things changed over that time? Because Australian Super has grown to be a very large fund now, um, but 13 years ago, it wasn't quite as big. Can you tell me a little bit about some of those changes and, and, and how you got started there? Yes, it is 13 years ago, and, and quite a lot has changed. Um, Sorry to remind you of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So as it turned out, Australian Super was was my biggest client um, before I before I joined. So, and when I joined the fund, it was in a in a hybrid role, which was to do both a combination of you know some direct investing and looking at our private markets investments, and some work on portfolio strategy. I'd done a fair bit of work when I was at Hastings, but also through my sort of actuarial and finance training on portfolio management. And, um, you know, Mark was keen and I was keen to see whether or not we could do a little bit of both in, in one role. And at the time, Australian Super would have had, you know, maybe 15 people on the investment team and about 20 billion in assets. So it was very much a sort of small to medium fund and, you know, in that environment, you're working across various different things. And so there was a good opportunity for breadth across, you know, potential direct opportunities and, you know, what we were looking at across the whole portfolio. And in some senses, one of the first things I did was really trying to take a bit of a more integrated view between, you know, bottom-up investment opportunities in terms of, you know, what markets are pricing certain assets at uh, and what we were thinking about from a top-down standpoint. In terms of you know asset allocation, outlook for equities, outlook for various markets, and you know the the week I joined Australian Super was the the week Bear Stearns collapsed. Okay, the date um, sort of etched in my brain, and so to join the fund at that time, and then you know it was four months later Lehman's collapsed, and then another four months before equity markets fully bottomed. It was a it was a really interesting time to sort of come in, uh, you know, see. The asset allocation process, uh, you know, in its full glory through a, through a crisis period, and then look for opportunities to invest, sort of coming out of the crisis. You know, one of the, one of the great investment opportunities early on was, you know, we participated in some senior debt um, as part of the Victorian desalination plan, and at the time, credit markets were effectively frozen. But to to get a, a transaction like that with solid government backing and effectively the, the refinancing risk was being covered by the government it was a pretty good deal. And the minute we did it, the investment committee said, oh, can we have a few more of those? <laughs> My response was, I think I think the time's probably passed. That, that's probably a high watermark. Yeah, I presume everybody was looking for government guaranteed investments uh, at that stage. Yeah, and look, at a time when, when capital is hard to find and when there isn't much liquidity, then you can take advantage of those opportunities, but they tend to fall away as, as things start to heal. And that's fine. That's just the way capital markets operate. But back to, the, I guess, the second part of your question about how Australian super's evolved, I mean, and how my role's evolved, it's 
it, it really has just been an evolution in a sense that um, you know as the funds grown, there's a need for all of us to to look at our roles and, and in some cases specialize. So um, pretty pretty early on in my journey, there was a decision that you know Australian Super was going to look to bulk up in terms of its internal management and its direct investing. And so there was a choice as to whether I spend more time on portfolio management or more on uh, the direct investing and and you know my my feeling was that um, you know I'd, I'd really like to spend more time on on directing the overall portfolio and um, you know there were plenty of people that were you know ready and ambitious to to establish more on our direct investing side. I guess the other added benefit is I can I can live vicariously through other people on the direct investing side <laughs> because uh, you know people. When we look at transactions, we bring them to a number of internal committees. So I still get to kind of whet the appetite, so to speak, when they sort of bring some of the larger deals for us to sign off on. Yeah. But yeah, the the place has evolved. I'd liken it to a lot of the a lot of the experience I had when I was in the US, where if you see a successful startup, you know, they have what the academics would call product market fit, you know, a really powerful product that consumers want and I think Australian Super really really sort of hit that mark you know a strong brand good performance low cost and you know what we've seen is that the fund's been you know phenomenally successful in terms of the growth and that's a, that's a path similar to a lot of the successful startups in Silicon Valley where you know if they get that acceptance there's then a need to actually move the organization onto a different growth trajectory in terms of its people and its process and its systems. Yep. And that really that really sort of forces a, a little bit of a culture change towards a more a more sophisticated and institutionalized way of doing things. But at the same time, you know, that that product market fit only exists because the core purpose of the, the company is is sound. And that's that's the thing that hasn't changed with Australian Super is the, the core purpose of being there to serve members and deliver. Yeah. returns to members doesn't change yeah you, you touched upon the internal management that was uh, was added over the years and there's been a lot of thoughts and discussion around does that change the culture of a pension fund what, what's been your take on that because you go from sort of a more back office related um, administration organization to suddenly you know pretty competitive people how, how does that work? Well, the culture does change to some respects. But the notion, I think, underlying your question is a connotation that when the culture changes, it's a negative. <laughs> I, thought, I, thought, I thought more in terms of a clash of cultures rather than a negative. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't necessarily see it as a clash of cultures. And that's partly about how, how you hire and how you motivate people. If what you're trying to do involves or leads you to hiring people where it's just trying to hire the highest paid and, and most sort of type A personality, then you'll, you'll most likely get a, a, a culture clash of some kind. But I think what we've probably tried to do with a lot of our hiring is to say to people, look, what Australian Super offers is the ability to manage and be involved in, you know, looking after quite a lot of capital on behalf of members. and that selling point is is really probably what we want a number of our people to focus on. It's not so much the remuneration, but also you know the added benefit is in in, in funds management. And I lived this for for quite a while. You know, uh, people have to spend a lot of their time managing clients and doing business development, and a lot of people don't like doing that. And it's also time consuming. So for some people, the pitch is actually look, the job is rewarding. It's almost all investing. There's very little business development, very little issues that happen where you have to manage both a shareholder and, and a client and the portfolio. And so reducing those conflicts of interest and simplifying the role and probably making it smaller and affording people work-life balance outside of that job is really attractive to some people. So finding those people who like that kind of, as our people and culture um, team would call it an employee value, value proposition and people who sort of like that then um, you know those are the people that will select in 
And it's quite likely when we run the, the kind of recruitment process, that there is a number of people who say, you know what, that's not interesting to me. And that's fine. And it's actually important for those people to select out early. Yeah. So that when we get into the shortlist, we know that people are buying into what the kind of risk reward trade-off is, you know, what the kind of hours are, you know, it do they really like that? And if they do, then there's a much better chance that they'll fit. Um and be much better aligned with the core purpose of, of the fund. I think what we found culturally is if you get those people, then what you have is really genuine, good investment conversations. You know, if I go and talk to our property guys or our infrastructure guys or our credit guys and say, is it a good time to invest? It's not always the case that they'll say yes. Yep. Whereas if you ask, if I, if, if I ask a fund manager, is it a good time to invest in their asset class? Um, They'll never say no. Um, <laughs> more often than not, they won't. Um, and and that's not to say that some people do, but yeah. but but certainly when when we ask all of our investment teams to take a whole of portfolio view, they'll often say, you know what, my sector might not be necessarily as good as others, or if or if there is a better opportunity to deploy capital in another asset class, then they'll be supportive of that because it'll be in the fund's best interest and by extension theirs. So a number of those agency issues disappear with internal management, but it then requires fostering the culture to, to support that. Yeah. So you, you touched upon there on, on sort of that whole of portfolio and um, you mentioned that you made a decision to focus on portfolio management. You've been involved uh, uh, for a number of years now in, in the asset allocation. Uh, but more recently, I think uh, two or three years ago, uh, uh, that changed to embracing the total portfolio approach and, and your title changed from head of asset allocation to head of total portfolio management. Can you tell us a little bit about why the decision was made and, and why that's a, a better way of doing things? So just as a, I guess, a point of context, in some ways the, the team title change and my title change in partly, ref, partly reflected the fact that there was now actually more of an industry standard terminology that reflected what I was doing. Right. So in some senses, a lot of the things that I've been doing for a number of years haven't changed. And it's probably more that there's been a, a term that people probably have a greater affinity with across the market rather than necessarily a, a substantial change in focus. Yeah. But for us, the most important thing about total portfolio is that about 97 or 98% of our fund's members retire based on the outcome of a diversified portfolio. They're not invested in equities or fixed income or cash. They're invested in a balanced portfolio or a, or a, perhaps a, a capital stable portfolio. They're invested in a blend of asset classes. And so if that's the case and we're, we are genuinely member-centric, then we should be concerned with the investment outcome of how all those diversified portfolios fit together. So at its core, it's trying to be member-centric, but make sure the investment outcomes actually impact the in-person. What do I, you know, where does that sort of come to bear? You know, it's partly about simple things like if we're spending members' money on, on active management, we need to make sure that that actual, that money is actively deployed and it's generating active returns that are impactful at a, at a total option level. Uh, and if things are diversifying away at a total portfolio level and not having impact, then why are we doing them? For us, it's, it is about trying to drive both a certain degree of efficiency with how we run and bring together the asset classes, but also just making sure that when you, when you add up the sum of the parts, it actually equals a coherent whole. Yep. Now the, the, the challenge, I think, often with a multi-manager or a multi-strategy setup is too often you have great ideas that just don't have impact to the total portfolio before. Yeah. And then in many cases, what we're trying to achieve is a concentration of ideas so that if, as I said, if someone has a really good idea, that you can actually see it have an impact on member account balances. You know, that's that can be a challenge as we, as we grow, but actually just having that mindset keeps us focused on, on doing things that are impactful. Yeah, and I think as part of the uh, total portfolio approach as well is that there's a 
a strong focus on on a risk and you use a risk budget for for making your um, investment decisions can you tell me a little bit about your thinking around that risk budget and also how do you split it between your team in the asset allocation and the portfolio management and sort of the teams at the individual asset classes yeah so i think risk budgeting is a, a term that gets you know bandied around the industry i think we have one or two of these every few years that becomes kind of the term right and it often sounds great but unless it's well implemented um it might not necessarily improve the outcome so i guess what we've learned about risk budgeting is that perhaps the term budget is a bit of a misnomer for us so as, as an active investor the critical thing for us in our risk framework is that we want to take risk when we think it's being well rewarded and take less risk when it's not being well rewarded now that's that's easy to say and hard to do but importantly when when we think about a risk budget it's important not to think about it as a fixed object so the fact that it's actually referred to as a budget indicates that it's a number that has to be spent mm -hmm. we probably think given our philosophy that it's probably more of a range and where we are in that range and we'll have a range at a total portfolio level and a range for each key part of the portfolio so there'll be a range for asset allocation for the equities group for the fixed income cash and currency group and for the you know mid risk group which is you know predominantly uh, property infrastructure and credit so we'll have a sort of broad budget for each but they'll they'll be framed in terms of ranges so that you know there's an expectation that there's an average amount of risk taking but depending on where we are, we'll, we might have more or less in a particular asset class or more or less at, a, at an asset allocation level, depending on where we are in the cycle. What that's trying to do is make sure that we keep portfolio actively invested through a cycle, but not to the point where we're taking undue risk where we don't think it's been well rewarded. So, you know, I think that that in many ways has been about trying to take a really good idea in theory, being risk budget, and then trying to meld it to our investment philosophy. And I think that's the really critical thing with any of these kind of, you know, fancy words and, and sort of sexy words that come up in investing is actually trying to make them fit with the investment philosophy is the most critical thing. Because if you don't do that, then what you're going to end up with is a conflict between your beliefs and your metrics. Yeah, but does it affect um, your side of the the role where I believe you guys do the dynamic asset allocation? Um, does that risk budget change as well, or just yeah? The but in terms of the budget, the range doesn't change, but where we are in that range does. Yeah. So we we work with our, our colleagues in the uh, team called Asset Allocation and Research, headed by Carla Story, who do a lot of work on the economic outlook and. So a lot of our asset allocation process is sort of co-created between our teams. Yeah, but but the amount of risk we're taking on asset allocation will vary. You know, I, I remember Bernie Fraser, who was the chair of the investment committee when I joined Australian Super, he said to me, equity markets never return their average. So why should we have an average allocation to equities? Which is true. And again, very easy to say, very hard to execute on. Yeah. But there's a, there's a point to it, which is that Long run averages are are exactly that. They're a long run average, but the variation around those averages are so substantial. And to the extent to which we can have insight on whether to have more or less of an asset class around those long run averages, then uh, you know we should be trying to exercise that. Yeah. So again, easy to say, hard to do. Yeah. So some of the asset allocation teams in in different funds. They do DAA. They they have a set target that they're going for, like I don't know, 30, 40 bips of uh, alpha. Is it, is it? Are you guys having that as well? We have a target, but we we measure it over a rolling period. So, and this this is the case for for a lot of teams where, you know, we we'll have an ambition or an objective, much the same as we have an objective for uh, uh, returns at a total portfolio level, but we'll try and measure it over a rolling period usually rolling three rolling five rolling 10-year periods because there will be times when particular views are out of favor and in many cases 
you know, some some strategies will have an outsized payoff in one year and be, you know, weak in other periods. So so yes, there's an objective, but given the nature of the the asset classes we're investing in, I think the worst thing you can do is try and measure them over short time periods yeah. in terms of the efficacy of the strategy. So in this sort of chaotic period with with the pandemic raging and a lot of uncertainty, does dynamic asset allocation become more important? It's a good question. I, I contend no, in, but in part because I think we'd probably hold the view that um, whether you call it dynamic asset allocation or whether you call it just being active with asset allocations, probably probably a worthwhile thing at all times. And it's very hard to know when it will pay off well. Yeah. So, you know, this is the challenge with a lot of active management, I think, is that it's hard to know when it will work very well, in which case it's very hard to actually time when to have a lot of it or when to have a little. So I think our view is, well, it's probably something we do all the time. And the key is making sure that the process provides the opportunity for the outsized returns when the rewards are good and hopefully limits drawdowns in periods where the chances of being wrong are higher. Yeah. So I think the pandemic was a good example where, you know, coming into, you know, January, February of last year, policy was tightening, implied vol was very low. So you had a couple of things going on in the environment where, you know, the reward for risk was was not particularly huge. And so the the opportunity to take kind of outsized positions was probably pretty low. And then you had this exogenous shock. Yeah. So it's not, um, I think, hard to kind of anticipate or predict exactly what might have happened with COVID. But the ability to make a lot of money going into that period was probably pretty low. Uh, and therefore, if you'd just taken a view that, you know, risk return trade-off for taking kind of large DAA positions was relatively low at that point in time, then you might have had, you know, limited losses coming through that period. And then once vol blew out and you've got a large degree of cross-sectional dispersion, then, you know, probably some opportunities for some outsized trades. Uh, if you're brave enough and you've got the liquidity kind of coming out of that period. Yeah. Can you give an example of a trade like that? I think the critical point for us was that we we made sure we were anchoring our process on on what kind of works well for our investment philosophy. So the critical thing for us in you know February and particularly in March of last year was sort of reappraising our view on the environment and saying what do we genuinely believe in terms of the likely policy response, you know, how bad the recession might be, how how short and sharp it could be, and what the likely kind of you know, response to markets would be from a particularly large stimulus. So, you know, we, our investment process anchors a fair bit on you know, a combination of value and, and where we are in the cycle and our outlook. And that kind of led us to a view that, you know, it was probably not going to be um, a particularly deep and long recession, but, you know, one where, you know, quite a large amount of policy will probably take the worst of all outcomes off the table in, in which case we we wanted to be sort of overweight risky assets yeah so you know, for us it was probably a time and you know this is i think often the case when you're faced with the odd crisis is just going back to what your process would say in the absence of having judgment is sometimes the best thing to do mm -hmm. it's good to have a kind of naive signal that's telling you what you should do because often in these periods the market behavior and the sentiment and the attitude of people might be to do the opposite yeah yeah so i think from an asset allocation perspective one of the main uh things that has happened in in the, in the last uh, well 10 years probably is the enormous amount of quantitative easing has uh, reduced the bond yields and arguably you know when you look at asset allocation suddenly one asset isn't re uh, behaving the way it historically has been. And there's a lot of discussions around the protective role of bonds, the conservative role of bonds. And some people have taken that as, okay, let's look at what else we can do. So um, we've written a little bit about this, this idea of, you know, a crisis risk offset sleeve where you put in a whole lot of things that are non-correlated with equities. 
And a lot of that is, uh, apart from still some bonds, is alternatives. Has had mixed results, partly because it depends on exactly what you invested in. What is your thinking around that role of bonds in a portfolio? And is it replaceable with other type of assets? It's a very difficult issue. (laughs) When we talk to a number of our peers around the world and around the Australian industry, I would say very few people have a sort of high conviction view about what to do with it. So if, if there were a sort of silver bullet, I'd suspect that we all would have we all would have fired it by now, so to speak. Um, the thing we keep coming back to is the role of bonds is, is to, in many ways, diversify equity risk. And so what we would need to think about in that instance is, well, what, what risks are we worried about from equities that we need to diversify against? So it doesn't depend a little bit on the collection of scenarios that you'd be interested in as to what's sort of causing the equity market to roll over. You know, quite clearly, if if what you're worried about is a Fed tightening induced sort of, you know, classical kind of slowdown, well, bonds won't help in that at all uh, until such time as the Fed's raise rates and the yield curve inverts. So, you know, I think it depends a lot on what you're actually trying to protect the portfolio from. You know, if, you, if you're worried about a sort of sec, a secular stagnation argument like an LR Japan, well, of course, bonds will still perform a decent role. I remember talking to a couple of people from GPIF, the big uh, yep. uh, Japanese pension fund, uh, came and saw us a few years ago, and they delivered a nominal return of 2%, but they'd still achieved CPI plus 4 because CPI was minus 2. <laughs> and, they, and, they had, and they had, you know, 60, 70% of their portfolio in JGBs at the time. So if you're worried about outright deflation and stagnation, then a GPIF style, you know, bond heavy, and they've moved more into equities recently, but a bond heavy portfolio will work well. If you're worried about, you know, a more more kind of classical scenario where you've still got growth, but you're seeing policy tightening, well, bonds won't help. So for, for us, it's probably about saying, well, what are the few scenarios that you're most worried about? And what are the correlations between equities and other asset classes going to be? And depending on what your beliefs on those are, then you'll form you'll form a, a view about what kind of basket diversifying assets uh, you hold. Yeah. So if we just look at a simple decision to diversify against big drawdowns in the equity market, what is then the right asset to hold? Depends on the scenario that causes it. It's also about it's also about your risk appetite and your, your ability to wear those drawdowns. I, I quite liked, I think there was some publication from New Zealand Super in not their last annual report, maybe the one from a year ago, that said, you know, if there's a GFC style drawdown, they'll see a drawdown in the portfolio of perhaps something in the order of 50%. And that they got their board of guardians comfortable with the fact that, you know, if that risk eventuated, that would be the outcome. So part of the issue is actually making sure things are within risk appetite. In many senses, I think for us, the, just looking at risk is, is sort of one aspect, but the other relevant factor, and we spend probably as much time on stress testing for this more uh, compared to returns, is liquidity. Yeah. So, you know, for us, what, what happens to the liquidity base of the portfolio and the amount of illiquid assets as we go through a crisis is perhaps, you know, if not as important, more important because, you know, losing control of the portfolio's liquidity leads you to a sort of path-dependent outcome where you might be a forced seller of a particular asset class simply because it's got liquidity. So in our view, you always have to make sure that the portfolio can withstand those issues and then you can look at the returns. So... A roundabout way of answering the question is probably if we've got our risk appetite set correctly, the next thing we often look at is ensuring that when we go through these scenarios that our portfolio liquidity is you know, set at a level which gives us the flexibility to be able to buy the most attractively priced assets at the bottom of the market. Yeah. You know, that's, the, that's the kind of the test we hold ourselves to because liquidity is a key enabler of being able to affect the asset allocation yeah and you don't want to be in a position where you lose control of that and i suppose there's also in the australian system where you you have 
investment options within the funds, you kind of have to remain true to label as well. If you if if you look at the balanced fund, which I think is the the my super stem the default option, you can't then have a, an underlying investment portfolio that has a completely different asset allocation than sort of the 70-30 or 80-20, whatever the split is, that has been set for that option. Yeah, that's correct. Although I, I would say that if in, in many instances, if if members are exercising a choice in that period, I guess Eric's you know, experience has been that they're moving yeah, in, into cash. And we, we've certainly done a lot of work trying to advise them to say, super is a long-term investment, be very careful about these decisions. The majority of people who switch to cash don't make a decision to go back into risk assets. And in, and in almost all instances, they're, they're worse off as a result. Yep. This happened in 2009 quite substantially. Um, you know, it happened again last year. You know, it's human nature and it's hard to fight. But importantly, if members are moving from, say, our balanced option to cash, they're moving from an option which has is in the in the majority invested in liquid asset classes. So actually, the most important thing we need to do when members switch is to to effectively they're reducing the size of the investment in the balanced option and increasing the amount in cash. So what we need to do is actually sell equities and bonds and transfer that into cash. And that's just reflecting a change in preference. Yeah. It's actually quite easy to manage if you look at it from that perspective. And as long as you do it progressively rather than kind of you know waking up you know a month or two later and realizing that the, the preferences have drifted substantially. The the biggest lament is that from an investment perspective, it's a preference and we have to respect the preference. But from a member engagement and advice perspective, it's a pretty poor preference. And um, yeah, by and large, most people who exercise, well, we actually had a, um, a university student do an honours thesis. And what they found was that over 60% of investment switching decisions attracted value. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's important, I think, for us that, you know, there, there is a real need to, to advise and help people that, you know, these switching decisions should be made in the cold light of day in the context of a longer term plan and not necessarily, not, not at all, or not necessarily in reaction to, you know, market volatility. Yeah. This is interesting because I remember, and this is quite a few years ago, you were on a panel with Jack Gray and Jack Gray told this story about how his son had absolutely no interest in superannuation and he thought that was a very healthy thing to, to have at his age. <laughs> it's um, the, uh, the, what's the saying? A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah. And, it, it, in, you know, in many senses it's right. You know, look, at one level, we would want every single person in the fund to be engaged with their superannuation, but engaged in a way that they're confident that what we're doing for them and helping them is going to help them achieve their goals, but not so engaged that they feel they need to log on to our website every day and check what the unit price is doing. I, I for one, hope that by the time I get to the point where I'm retired, the last thing I think about is checking my super balance. I actually don't think it's very good for people's mental health to be to be looking at their worth on a, on a regular basis. Mm. You know, I, I always go back to this point. I remember my my mother rang me up in two thousand and eight and said, "Oh, I'm really worried about this crisis. You know, what's it going to do to the value of my house?" And I said to her, "Are you selling your house tomorrow?" And she said, "No." I said, "Good. Well, why why are you concerned about the value of your house today if you're not selling it tomorrow?" And the same goes for things like equities. Yeah. And, and particularly relevant for people in retirement is if you're not selling your equity portfolio tomorrow, why are you worried about what it's worth today? You know, so why we often look at rolling three and rolling five and 10 year averages for, for things like valuations and markets and account balances for this exact reason that intrinsic value manifests over time. And what it is on any given day at a member level is probably just not necessarily relevant yeah. they should be worried about whether or not whether or not they're on track to meet their objectives and whether or not they're contributing enough so yeah i i think in many senses the industry's moved to you know a high level of engagement and you know daily pricing a lot of disclosure that's great because it's important for us to have a robust and transparent industry but all that extra information just gives people the feeling that they should worry about all of it more. Yeah. And at a member level, I'm, 
when I think about my own superannuation, I, I try and look at it once every few years. It's you make a decision and you should stick with it mm-hmm. and worry about the outcome, not not necessarily the journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, this industry has always been one that uh, um, there's been a lot of tinkering going on. And um, some of the more recent changes that uh, have come up is the uh, your future, your super reforms. Now, from some of the funds that I've been talking to, there's a bit of concern around the way the performance test is structured. So the idea is that you take the asset allocation that's listed in your PDS and they measure it against sort of a reference portfolio of asset allocation by by indices. Uh, one of the main issues that I've heard with that is that it, it, it basically puts more attention on tracking error. And so as a fund like Australian Super, who has a belief in active management, you tend to have times where there is more tracking error, where there's less tracking error. And there's a bit of concern that, that this reinforces the already shift we've seen sort of globally amongst institutional investors to more passive. Are you concerned around these new rules and the role that active management can have in your portfolio? There's a really simple answer to this and there's a really complex answer to this. (laughs) (laughs) Let's hear them both. Uh, The simple answer is no, I'm not concerned. And the reason for that is because we've been doing benchmarking for how we sort of measure the effectiveness of our investment program internally for the best part of eight to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And and the sky hasn't fallen in. And in fact, at the margin, things have probably improved because what we're worried about is whether or not we're getting the right amount of tracking error for the right cost spend and the right performance outcome. So it's really forced us to think about it like a business and look at whether we're getting return on investment. So I I actually testified in front of the Productivity Commission review in respect of benchmarking. And it effectively said something to this effect that, you know, we, we think that benchmarking helps. So on that level, I'm not worried about it. But on another level, I am, and that's it's primarily the behavioural aspect to, to all this. The, th- the thing we've learned from, from having benchmarking, and and I should say my, my observations about the performance test are more about the principle. I think there's been a lot of debate in the industry about the actual technical application, but, but in principle, my concerns are more about the behavioural issues. Mm-hmm. And it's more... It's more um, I guess what we've learned is that if you have all this stuff, you need to actually make sure that things like anchoring, loss aversion, herding, you know, those kind of behaviours that come from benchmarking, that you're actively designing a way to invest that actually manages those issues. And that's probably what we've really learned is that it's important to measure things, but if you're not encouraging people to invest in the right way, then you can get all the bad side effects of what comes from benchmarking. So my sense is that if if the if each super fund has the right culture to promote active risk taking and can prove their worth, then they shouldn't have any issues here. What they actually will have is a greater confidence on the fact that where they're spending money, they're delivering value for their members, which to me in principle sounds like a pretty good thing. Part of that then leads to a challenge around how, how you make sure you implement that and foster the right culture. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a really complicated issue. Will it lead to more indexing? I think you sort of mentioned that in your question. Yeah. Look, our experience is that when we've done more work on where we spend value for money, the bit that's fallen out of the portfolio is you know active management that's potentially redundant. Not necessarily poor active managers, but those that diversify away at a total portfolio level. Um, and we've either replaced those with internal managers or uh, at the margin, in maybe some indexing, but actually very, very, very little. If you look through our portfolio at the moment, we would have, you know, if you exclude cash, the best part of about 80% of our portfolio, 90% would be regarded as actively managed. Mm-hmm. So it, it certainly hasn't changed our approach to active management. What it's done is really lifted the bar and said to all of our active managers, both internal and external, and internal managers are held to the same discipline, is how can you add value, net of tax, net of fees, 
over a reasonable rolling period? And those are the questions we would ask the companies we invest in. How are you making profit for uh, for us and for the members of the fund over a period of time? I can't, I can't see why that's a poor discipline yeah. unless the behavioural finance style issues cloud what is meant to be a good investment outcome. That in many ways is something we look at at a total portfolio level, which is often to sort of say to people, well, okay, I've given you, I've given team XYZ a benchmark, but what are you going to do with the money? So it's important when we sort of look at a a multi-manager, a multi-strategy portfolio to always come back to the point, well, if the outcome isn't sensible, then perhaps the process that's got got us there isn't necessarily helping. So And benchmarking is a good example of that, which is if it's not promoting people to invest in what they think are the best opportunities, then, you know, maybe we need to go back and look at it. And that's the the kind of conversation we we have with some of our internal teams is there's there's measurement, but what are you actually doing with the money? And we find that kind of helps get to a common sense outcome. Yeah, yeah. I want to finish up with uh, looking a little bit outside of your activities with Australian Super. You, I believe you you took a sabbatical where you spent some time in the US and, and did work for uh, Stanford University. And, and, and one of that was, I believe you worked with Ashby Monk on the use of technology by institutional investors. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll eventually get uh, our, um, our research published here. Uh, Paradoxically, when you're writing a paper about technological disruption, it's become more important to publish the paper, but been made more difficult by the pandemic because we've we've both had other priorities to uh, to address. But yeah. what we're looking at, we did a whole heap of case study research on how large institutional investors were dealing with the risk of technological disruption in their investment portfolio. So it's not so much about how investors use technology, but how it impacts portfolios. Okay. And to to give you a little bit of a sneak peek uh, on a few of the insights, what we've really found is that disruption in itself isn't really a new thing. And the challenge is that it happens, it can happen over long time scales and often using data that isn't necessarily well captured in things like risk models, you know, because you're looking across cycles and through cycles, or you're looking at things like regime change. So it's really hard to actually use a lot of the the sort of financial mathematics that a lot of people in risk management and portfolio management use these days. But I guess what we found is that you've you've kind of got a cycle of innovation and disruption and then a cycle of markets that that both speculate and discount those waves. And for a lot of institutional investors, you know, we have a very large exposure to incumbent portfolio companies that are at greater risk of disruption than they are of innovating. Mm-hmm. You, know, you just look at shopping centres versus you know, e-commerce. This is the kind of poster child that a lot of institutional investors have lived through in the last five, 10 years. So it's important, I think, for investors to think about it as, to use an American football term, to think about it as much about defence as it is about offence. You know, often when people think about technological disruption, they say, oh, I should buy some venture funds. <laughs> well, Silicon Valley, the amount of money invested in Silicon Valley is about $400 billion, So that's two Australian supers. It's never going to be big enough to actually make a difference. But what you've got in your shopping centre portfolio might, what you have in your equity portfolio might, just by weight of value. Yeah, And I kind of come up with a a really good analogy that a a team member left with me was if you went back to the early 1900s, you know, the biggest revolution then was really sort of mechanisation and the production of automobiles. And at the time, there were 125 companies that sprang up in the the US and mainly in Detroit to try and kind of win the mass-produced automobile war. Now, as it turns out, Ford and Chrysler and a couple of others won. But for most people that invested in those companies, they lost all of their money yeah. because only a few were successful out of 125. And that's venture, right? Yeah. You know, it's a very skewed, you know, you, you hear about the big wins, you don't hear about all the losses. Yeah. But the most important thing to do at that time was probably to sell horses, right? It wasn't necessarily to buy. If you could buy Ford, congratulations, 
But the most obvious thing to do was, as an institutional investor is to look for the horses yeah. because that's the big exposure we have. And importantly, to figure out when to sell the horse, all you needed to do was to figure out that one car company was going to win. So it's actually a slightly easier decision to make. Yeah, because you don't have to figure out. All you have to figure out is whether a technology will disrupt, not who's going to be the winner. And so, you know, I think this this area is something that you know requires a lot of thought. But this is a this is a longer cycle risk. Mm-hmm. It parallels a lot of the issues and themes we see in things like ESG and climate change, where you know the issues are likely to come to bear, but they they will take time. And financial markets go through periods of not pricing them at all. And then perhaps fully pricing them. Yep. I mean, you think about what you've got to pay for a renewable energy asset at the moment. Yeah. That's that's pricing in quite a lot of carbon risk, but also it it presumes that there won't be any new technologies that displace those existing renewables. So mm. markets go through cycles in pricing these, and we just have to be careful. You know, the the perfect parallel, you know, to a more recent period is if you look at 1997 through to 2001, some phenomenal companies were created in that period, but a lot of people lost a lot of money. But out of that period emerged the really strong internet powerhouses, the ability to then develop that into cloud and mobile applications. So you had you had a phenomenal speculative boom that invested a heap of money into a sector. And then eventually some successful people emerged. Yeah. Your mind might be wondering into, you know, is this what's going on with blockchain and crypto at the moment? There's so much money flowing into the space. Yeah. Hard to tell who's going to win. You know, a lot of talk of this time it's different and other successes. So, you know, these things have... Um, You're not a strong believer in crypto, I, I take it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, someone I heard a joke one day. Someone said to me that crypto is the veganism in investing. You know, if you if you love it, you think everyone else is uh, is is a bit silly. So, <laughs> um, I look something will come out of it. The the notion that it's a store of value when central banks would like to maintain sovereignty over money supply and their tax base seems to me to be a blocker to what the value of cryptocurrencies are, but. The, the notion that the world will continue to operate through checks or even credit cards to me seems I, I can't see that occurring in 30 years time. So yeah. the way in which we transact will change, but upon what platform that occurs, you know, that's the battlefront. And I'm, I would guess that there are a number of banks and credit card companies that are very focused on thinking about who's going to win the war in, in payments and transactions. Yeah. Might be Google. I think I can't remember the last time I actually took my wallet with me, <laughs> other than just paying with my phone. So maybe that's uh, where it's going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and the simple answer is if you, you know, if you if you are interested in some of this, sometimes looking to places like China are relevant. Yeah. There, there's often, a, and having spent a bit of time in the valley while I was on sabbatical. What you realize is that in, in relation to e-commerce, China's probably a little bit further ahead. Mm. However, there are obviously substantial challenges which become really apparent to a lot of investors recently with the fact that it's very hard to untangle the government from the financial system. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned venture a couple of times, and um, mm. I saw that you're a founding partner of Reaction, which is a venture firm that I think focuses mainly on innovation, but also linked to sustainability. Is, is that, uh, did you get involved in that when you were in Silicon Valley? Yeah, I did. Um, so I I did a um, did some study at the business school, and the the cohort of people I was with were kind of leaders across various industries and and about fifty odd countries. And we, we formed the view that there was a lot of great things that were happening in Silicon Valley, but they weren't always reaching places outside the US, and particularly a lot of emerging and developed countries. And so, you know, reaction um, is, I guess, our what we believe is an opportunity to invest into into those economies using using technology that might be a bit more prevalent in the US. So a good example is, um, you know, there's a, a portfolio company is providing, I guess, big data solutions to mum and dad invest, uh, mum and dad sort of corner store owners in India. So, you know, most people buy their groceries daily 
from a corner store in India. Mm -hmm. But how do those people who are running those small stores know what inventory to stock? Well, it was thumb in the air. But providing those people with um, access to distribution facilities and the data to know well, what to order when helps those mum and dads become more more profitable. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunities, I think, to take great technology into the emerging and developed world and reactions about trying to improve the lives of people and hopefully we'll make some money along the way. But it's it's primarily about the fact that, you know, these economies can benefit from technology probably far more than we can in places like Australia. Yeah, yeah. Because you're taking people out of potentially out of poverty or out of a low income into a medium income. And that and that improvement, you know, as we've as we've learned over the last thirty years, you know, about eight hundred to a billion people have been moved out of abject poverty into some kind of decent income through globalization and trade. It's been the biggest economic revolution um, in quite a while, and there's more to be done in places like India, Africa, Southeast Asia, and um, and South America, and and you know, myself and our alumni have various connections and networks in those places yeah yeah that's interesting work interesting work well alistair thank you very much you've been very generous with your time so i'll, I'll let you go but thank you very much for this conversation i enjoyed it a lot thanks good to talk thank you for listening to the i3 podcast for more information please visit www.i3-invest.com thank you very much Thank you.